Hello. Welcome to the Bore You to Sleep podcast. The podcast that will hopefully help you get to sleep. I am going to read an open source book, one that is not particularly interesting, but one that is hopefully boring enough to get you to sleep. Tonight's reading comes from T. It's History and Mystery. Written by Joseph M. Walsh and published in 1892, this book explores the history and origins of tea. My name is Teddy, and I aim to help people everywhere get a good night's rest. Sleep is so important, and my mission is to help you get the rest that you need. The podcast is designed to play in the background while you slowly fall asleep. Thank you to everyone who shared their words of gratitude with me during the week. Whether it be through the website or the podcast app, one of the most rewarding aspects of the podcast is hearing from all the listeners who found the podcast beneficial in helping them get a good night's rest. Thank you to all of the Spotify listeners who took the time to leave a response in their episode Q&A. Some of the listeners who responded include Paige, MyReynoso13, MissManda30, Isabel, and Ravalangi. And thank you to the listeners who shared this as their most played podcast of 2023. M and Tyler Benton, thank you for listening. As always, a massive thank you goes to the patrons on Patreon that continue to support the podcast. Your monthly subscription allows me to continue bringing out more episodes, and without your support, I would not be able to do it. My goal is to keep this podcast completely free so that everyone can access it who needs it, and it's the support from listeners like you that allows me to do so. If you are in a position to support the show with a monthly contribution, please visit boytosleep.com. Whether it's $1 or $5, it does not take long, and your contribution allows me to continue doing what I do. A fantastic way to say thank you is also to leave a review or share the podcast with a friend. To leave a review, jump into your podcast app and please leave a nice comment. In the meantime, lie back, relax and enjoy the readings. T. It's History and Mystery by Joseph M. Walsh author of Coffee, Its History, Classification and Description, copyrighted in 1892. Prefatory, Utility, not originality, has been aimed at in the compilation of this work. The obstacles and difficulties its author had met with in his endeavours to learn something of the article he was commissioned to sell when he first entered the tea trade. The almost total lack of knowledge displayed by the average dealer in the commodity, allied to the numerous inquiries for a work containing all about tea, first prompted the undertaking. The material was collated at intervals in a fragmentary manner, covering a period of over 20 years and arranged amid the many interruptions incident to an active business life, subjected to constant revisions, repeated prunings and innumerable corrections, due mainly to the varying statements and conflicting opinions of admitted authorities in every branch of this subject. Still, As careful and judicious an arrangement of the data has been given as possible, 
a faithful effort being made to omit nothing that may prove useful, instructive or profitable to the expert, the dealer or general reader, aware that many facts have been omitted and many errors committed in its preparation. He still trusts that the pains he has taken to avoid both have not been in vain, that the former may be few and the latter of no great importance. The work was compiled under impulse, not under inducement. A single line not being intended originally for the market and is now being published solely for the benefit of those whom it may concern. Philadelphia, December, 1892. Chapter 1. Early History. The history of tea is intimately bound up with that of China, that is, so far as the Western world is concerned its production and consumption being for centuries confined to that country. But having within the past two centuries become known and almost indispensable as an article of diet in every civilised country of the globe, it cannot but prove interesting to inquire into the progress, properties and effects of a commodity which could have induced so large a portion of mankind to abandon so many other articles of diet in its favour, as well as the results of its present enormous consumption. Although now to be found in a wild state in the mountain ranges of Assam, and in a state of cultivation through a wide range from India to Japan, the original country of tea is not definitely known, but from the fact of its being in use in China from the earliest times, it is commonly attributed to that country. Yet though claimed to have been known in China long anterior to the Christian era, and even said to have been mentioned in the Sao Pao published 2700 BC, and also in the Rai 600 BC, the exact date or manner of its first discovery and use in that country is still in doubt. One writer claims that the famous herb was cultivated and classified in China 2000 BC, almost as completely as it is today and that it was used as a means of promoting amity between Eastern monarchs and potentates at this early period. Qin Nung, a celebrated scholar and philosopher who existed long before Confucius, is claimed to have said of it, Tea is better than wine, for it leadeth not to intoxication, neither does it cause a man to say foolish things and repent thereof in his sober moments. It is better than water, for it doth not carry disease, neither doth it act as a poison, as doth water when the wells contain foul and rotten matter. And Confucius admonishes his followers to be good and courteous to all, even to the stranger from other lands. If he say unto thee that he thirsteth, give unto him a cup of warm tea without money and without price. A Chinese legend describes its first discovery to one Dharma, a missionary famed throughout the East for his religious zeal, who in order to set an example of piety to his followers, imposed on himself various privations, among which was that of forswearing sleep. After some days and nights passed in this austere manner, he was overcome and involuntarily fell into a deep slumber, on awakening from which he was so distressed at having violated his vow, 
and in order to prevent a repetition of allowing tired eyelids to rest on tired eyes. He cut off the offending portions and flung them to the ground. On returning the next day, he discovered that they had undergone a strange metamorphosis, becoming changed into a shrub, the like of which had never been seen before. Plucking some of the leaves and chewing them, he found his spirits singularly exhilarated and his former vigour so much restored that he immediately recommended the newly discovered bone to his disciples. Tradition, on the other hand, never at a loss for some marvellous story, but with more plausibility, claims that the use of tea was first discovered accidentally in China by some Buddhist priests, who, unable to use the brackish water near their temple, steeped in the leaves of a shrub growing in the vicinity, with the intention of correcting its unpleasant properties. The experiment was so successful that they informed the inhabitants of their discovery, subsequently cultivating the plant extensively for that express purpose. While another record attributes its first discovery, about 2737 BC, to the aforementioned Qin Nung, to whom all agricultural and medicinal knowledge is traced in China. In replenishing a fire made of branches of the tea plant, some of the leaves fell into the vessel in which he was boiling water for his evening meal. Upon using it, he found it to be so exciting and exhilarating in its effects that he continued to use it, imparting the knowledge thus gained to others. Its use soon spread throughout the country. These accounts connected with the first discovery of the tea plant in China are purely fabulous and it is not until we come down to the 4th century of the Christian era that we can trace any positive allusion to it by Chinese writers. But as the early history of nearly every other ancient discovery is more or less vitiated by fable, we ought not to be any more fastidious or less indulgent towards the marvellous in the discovery of tea than we are towards that of fire, iron, glass, or coffee. The main facts may be true, though the details may be incorrect, and though the accidental discovery of fire may not have been made by Su Jin in the manner claimed. Yet it probably was communicated originally by the friction of two sticks, nor may it be strictly correct to state that Fu He made the accidental discovery of iron by the burning of wood on brown earth, any more than the Phoenicians discovered that making glass by burning green wood on sand. Yet it is not improbable that some such accidental processes first led to these discoveries. Thus, also considerable allowances are to be deducted from the scientific discoveries of Qin Nung in botany, when we read of his having in one day discovered no less than 70 different species of plants that were poisonous, and 70 others that were antidotes against their baneful effects. According to some Chinese authorities, the tea plant was first introduced into their country from Korea as late as the 4th century of the present era, from whence it is said to have been carrying to Japan in the 9th, others again maintaining that it is undoubtedly indigenous to China, being originally discovered on the hills of those provinces, where it now grows so abundantly, no date, however, has been named. While the Japanese, to whom the plant is as valuable as it is to the Chinese, state that both countries obtained it simultaneously from Korea, 
about 828 AD. This latter claim not being sustained by any proof whatever, to the contrary, who relying on the statements of certain Japanese writers to this effect, argues in support of their assertions, the improbability of which is unconsciously admitted by von Siebold himself when he observes that in the southern provinces of Japan, the tea plant is abundant on the plains, but as the traveller advances towards the mountains, it disappears, hence inferring that it is an exotic. The converse of this theory holding good of China, a like inference tends to but confirm their claim that with them the plant is indigenous that the Japanese did not originally obtain the plant from Korea, but from China, is abundantly proven by the Japanese themselves, many of whom admit that it was first introduced to their country from China about the middle of the ninth century. In support of this acknowledgement, it is interesting to note, as confirming the Chinese origin of tea, that there is still standing at Yuji, not far from Osaka, a temple erected on what is said to have been the first tea plantation established in Japan, sacred to the traditions of the Japanese and in honour of the Chinese, who first introduced the tea plant into the island empire. Another more authentic account states that the tea seed was brought to Japan from China by the Buddhist priest Miyoi about the beginning of the 13th century and first planted in the southern island of Kyushu, from whence its cultivation soon spread throughout that country. Some English writers go as far as to claim that Assam in India is the original country of tea, from the fact that a species has been discovered there in a wild state, as well as in the slopes of the Himalaya mountains. But though found in both a wild and cultivated state in many countries of the East at the present time, all its Western traditions point to China, and to China only, as the original country of tea, and that the plant is native and indigenous to that country, is indisputably beyond question. It was not known to the Greeks or Romans in any form, and that it could not have been known in India in very early times, is inferred from the fact that no reference to the plant or its product is to be found in the Sanskrit but that the plant and its use not only as an agreeable and exhilarating beverage, but as an article of traffic worthy of other nations, must have been known to the Chinese as early as the first century of the Christian era. The following extract from an ancient work entitled The Periplus of the Erythaean Sea may serve to prove the author usually supposed to be Arian, after describing a city called Thinae, proceeds to narrate a yearly mercantile journey to the vicinity of a certain people called Sessitae, of short stature, broad faces and flat noses. Evidently natives of China adds that the articles they bring for traffic outwardly resemble vine leaves, being wrapped in mats which they leave behind them on their departure to their own country in the interior. From these mats the Thinae pick out a home called Petros, from which they draw the fibre and stalks. Spreading out the leaves they double and make them into balls, passing the fibre through them in which form they take the name of Malabathram, and under his name they are brought into India by those who prepare them. 
Under any interpretation, this account sounds like a remote, obscure and confused story. Still one of the authors of the able historical account of China, published in 1836, has ventured to identify this malabathrum of the thin with the tea of the Chinese. Vossius Vincent and other authors, while admitting the difficulty of understanding why it should be, carried from Arakan to China, and from China back to India, unhesitatingly assert that Malabathrum was nothing more than the beetle leaf. Horace mentions Malabathrum, but only as an ointment. Pliny refers to it both in that sense and as a medicine. Dioscorides describing it as a masticatory only. While the author of the historical account prefers to consider the passage in the Periplus as a very clumsy description of a process, not intelligently understood by the describer, but as agreeing far better with the manipulation of tea, than with that of the beetle leaf, and his conjecture, unsupported as it is, merits citation, if only for its originality. The first positive reference to T is that by Q Long in the 4th century, who not only describes the plant, but also the process of preparing it, of which the following is a free and condensed translation. On a slow fire set a tripod, whose colour and texture show its long use, and fill it with clear snow water. Boil it as long as would be sufficient to turn crayfish red, and throw it upon the delicate leaves of choice tea. Let it remain as long as the vapour arises in a cloud, and only a thin mist floats on the surface. Then at your ease drink the precious liquor so prepared, which will chase away the five causes of sorrow. You can taste and feel, but not describe the state of repose produced by a beverage thus prepared. It is again mentioned by Lo Yu, a learned Chinese who lived during the dynasty of Tang, in 618, who became quite enthusiastic in its praise, claiming that it tempers the spirit, harmonizes the mind, and dispels lassitude and relieves fatigue, awakens thought and clears the perspective, and according to Qiang Mu, a historical epitome an impost duty was levied on tea as early as 782 by the Emperor Te Sing and continued to the present day. Macpherson, in his History of European Commerce with India, states that tea is mentioned as the usual beverage of the Chinese by Solomon, an Arabian merchant who wrote an account of his travels in the East about the year 850. By the close of the 9th century, however, tea was found in general use among the Chinese, the tax upon it at that time being a source of considerable revenue, as recorded in the history books. There is also independent evidence furnished by two other Arabian travellers in a narrative of their wanderings, during the latter half of the ninth century, admitting their statements to be trustworthy as to the general use of tea as a beverage among the Chinese at that period. Moorish travellers appear to have introduced it into the Mohammedan countries early in the 10th century, and other travellers in China in the 17th give most extravagant accounts of its virtues which appears to have been in very general use throughout the greater part of Asia at that time. Father de Rhodes, a Jesuit missionary who entered China in 1633, 
states that the use of tea is common throughout the East and begins, I perceive, to be known in Europe. It is in all the world to be found only in two provinces of China, where the gathering of it occupies the people as the vintage does us. Adding that he found it in his own case to be an instantaneous remedy for headache, and when compelled to sit up all night to hear confessions, its use saved him from drowsiness and fatigue. Adam O'Larius, describing the travels of an embassy to Persia in 1631, says of the Persians, They are great frequenters of taverns, called Tsai Chatai, where they drink tea or cha, which the Tartars bring from China, and to which they assign extravagant qualities, imagining that it all alone will keep a man in perfect health, and are sure to treat all those who visit them to this drink at all hours. These strong expressions as to the use of tea, applying as they do to a period not later than 1640, are sufficient to prove that the ordinary accounts place the introduction of that beverage as regards Europe, particularly the continent, as too late. The earliest European notice of tea is that found in a work by Ramusio, first printed in 1550, though written several years prior to that year. In it he quotes Hazi Muhammad in effect, and these people of Cathay, China, do say that if these in our parts of the world only knew tea, there is no doubt that our merchants would cease altogether to use Ravino Chini, as they call rhubarb. Yet no accounts at present accessible establish the date of its first introduction into Europe, and it is also a difficult matter to determine to which of the two nations, Portugal or Holland, the credit of first introducing it belongs. Some writers claiming that the Dutch East India Company brought tea to Amsterdam in 1600, while the Portuguese claim the honour of its first introduction prior to that year. An indisputable argument in favour of the latter is the notice given of it by Giovanni Maffi in the History of India. That book was published in 1559. The inhabitants of China, like those of Japan, he writes, extract from a herb called chia, a beverage which they drink warm and which is extremely wholesome, being a remedy against phlegm, languor, and a promoter of longevity. While Giovanni Batiro, another Portuguese, in a work published in the same year, states that the Chinese have a herb from which they press a delicate juice, which they use instead of wine, finding it to be a preservative against these diseases, which are produced by the use of wine amongst us. Taxira, also a native of Portugal, states that he saw the dried leaves of tea and malacca some years prior to 1600, and the article is also mentioned in one of the earliest privileges accorded to the Portuguese for trading in 1558. Yet it was not until nearly a century from the beginning of that trade that we find the first distinct account from a European pen of the use of tea as a beverage. In a dissertation upon tea by Thomas Short, printed in London in 1730, the author gives the following account of its first introduction into Europe. The Dutch East India Company, on their second voyage to China, carried thither a good store of sage and exchanged it with the Chinese for tea, 
receiving three to four pounds of the last for one pound of the first. By calling it a wonderful European herb, possessed of as many virtues as the Indians could describe to their shrub leaf. But because they exported not such large quantities of sage as they imported of tea, they also bought a great deal of the latter, giving eight to ten pence a pound for it in China. And when they first brought it to Paris, they sold it for thirty livres the pound, but thirty years ago, the Chinese sold it at threepence, and never above ninepence a pound at any time, frequently mixing it with other herbs to increase the quantity. Macaulay also states in the history of his embassy to China that early in the 17th century some Dutch adventurers seeking for such objects as might fetch a price in China and hearing of a general use there of a beverage produced from a plant of the country, bethought themselves of trying how far a European plant of supposed great virtues might also be appreciated by the Chinese. They accordingly introduced them to the herb sage, the Dutch accepting in exchange the Chinese tea which they brought back with them to Holland. These statements but tend to confirm the Portuguese claim, the efforts of the Dutch to open up trade with the Chinese in tea, being evidently made many years subsequent to the introduction by the former, in still further support of which the following may be noted. In 1662, Charles II married the Portuguese princess, Catherine of Braganza, who it is said was very fond of tea, having been accustomed to it in her own country. Waller, in a poem celebrating the event, ascribes its first introduction to her country in the appended lines. Venus her myrtle has, Phoebus her bays, T both excels, which she vouchsafes to praise. The best of queens and best of herbs we owe, To that proud nation which the way did show. The earliest mention made of tea by an Englishman is that contained in a letter from a Mr. Wickham, agent of the East India Company at Ferrando, Japan and dated June 27th, 1615, to a Mr. Eaton, another officer of the company, resident at Macau, China, asking for a pot of the best jar. How the commission was executed does not appear but in Mr. Eaton's subsequent account of expenditures occurs this item. Three silver porringers to drink tea in. The first person, however, to advocate the use of tea in Europe was Cornelius Botrico, a professor of the Leiden University, who in a treatise on tea, coffee and chocolate, published in 1649, strongly pronounces in favour of the former, denying the possibility of its being injurious, even when taken in immoderate quantities. Tea was evidently known in England, previous to its direct importation there, small quantities having been brought from Holland as early as 1640, but used only on rare occasions. The earliest mention made of it, however, is that contained in a copy of the Mercurius Politicus, at present in the British Museum, and dated September 1658, in which attention is called to that excellent, and by all physicians approved, China drink, called by the Chinese Cha, and by other nations Tay, sold at the Sultanus Head, 
a coffee house by the Royal Exchange, London. The most famous house for tea at this early period, however, was Garway's more popularly known for upwards of two centuries, as Garway's being swept away only a few years ago by the March of Improvement, and Defoe refers to it as being frequented only by people of quality, who had business in the city and the wealthier citizens. But later, it became the resort of speculators, and here it was that the numerous schemes which surrounded and accompanied the great South Sea Bubble had their centre, and appropriately enough, Garway's was also the headquarters of that most remarkable but disastrous tea speculation of 1842. And that concludes tonight's readings. I hope you have enjoyed this story, and I hope you are feeling drowsy. If you're not quite tired yet, please feel free to listen to another episode of the Boy to Sleep podcast. Until next time, and good night.